over the weekend. <laughs> oh yes, yes, uh, that was um, uh, that was some that was some quite good fun as I'm as I'm sure you've seen the videos. Yeah. Um, one of them in particular of uh, of one of the troons um, being um, a little bit uh, a little bit less than convivial um, has caught a lot of social media traction, and you know it's it's people are talking about it in the United Kingdom and United States and things like that. So yeah. Uh, it's um, it's great when that happens. You know, it, it helps to uh, to start the conversation and for people to see what's really going on. Yeah. So, uh, what were you recording? Uh, well, uh, the event was uh, at the the Pioneer Women's Memorial Hall. Um, that is a building that was proposed uh, by by uh, some suffragettes in the late eighteen nineties and and shortly after the turn of the century. Uh, to be a place um, for uh, women's societies mm -hmm. to be able to 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 meet and conduct meetings and uh, um, do the sort those sorts of things. Uh, and this weekend, as part of Pride, uh, that that building was occupied um, by the Disinformation Project, uh, Auckland Pride, and um, and prominent uh, trans activists such as Shamil Lal uh, to talk about things to do with um, with queer liter literary uh, uh, experiences. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, amongst the women's rights groups, they were pretty disconcerted that a space which uh, nominally is devoted to to uh, women's issues and women's societies was being occupied and colonized uh, by by um, those sorts of people. Uh, so decided to go along and film it, um, film outside rather than film inside. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a ticketed event and uh, we weren't invited and I'm sure they would not have uh, enjoyed our presence. So uh, we were just filming outside to sort of keep an eye on what was going on. And uh, as it happened, uh, we did catch some action. Yeah. Um, it, it, it certainly was the case, as you've probably seen from the from yeah. the footage, that um, that the the trans rights activists are um, not keen on having their behaviour exposed, and that very much includes public photography. Mm. Um, what sort of behaviours were were going on outside there? <laughs> Uh, I've watched I've watched the video, so I know exactly what's going on. But I'm keen to hear from you what what you experienced. Yeah, well, um, the well, after uh, here in New Zealand after after the events of Posey Parker and Albert uh, Albert Park last year, uh, it was the case. It has become the case that the rainbow community is very very cognizant of the damage that video footage of their um, uh, violence and demented behavior, yeah. the damage that that does to their cause. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, you would think that any organization that has uh, an interest in public relations mm. would perhaps say, okay, well, look, you know, we're not winning any hearts and minds by assaulting women and behaving so terribly. Yeah. Uh, let's stop doing that. Mm. Uh, instead, what they try to do is to prevent the publication of photography demonstrating them do, doing that, uh, which is what they tried to do on Saturday where um, they, they're, they're trained to interfere with photographers, to try and block camera shots, to uh, mob photographers and to distract them by, by, by saying awful things. And you will have seen from, from the, the videos that myself and the other cameramen uh, released that um, – that it, the, the, their approach is um, is certainly not something that you would want uh, young people to uh, to have to listen to. Their behavior on the video that I watched was quite quite vulgar, if I can use that word. You know, it's, it's quite disgusting behavior. Why do you think they behave that way? What's what's going on? Uh, well, I think it's quite reflective of the thinking. Um, within the broader com rainbow community, but also specifically uh, amongst the the trans rights activists and the troons, that um, that they become rather myopically focused on 
uh, sexual issues and that shines through in their language. And, and, and as you say, um, the, the content of what was said in, in those videos um, is, is astonishing. It, it would not be broadcastable, for instance. Was it a he or a she? Uh, well, it's a, 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 a biological man um, who I would assume is uh, going through the process of um, quote unquote transitioning. Right. Um, so so I, I would maybe the hormones are a bit misplaced. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would say in that particular individual's case that there's probably a combination of hormone replacement therapy and um, recreational drugs and perhaps psychiatric medication. Yeah, yeah, because he was quite aggressive. He was making some disgusting comments about, yeah, all sorts of things. Yes, uh, and um, and a lot of um, because you know there's a lot of people within the gay community who are are really concerned about um, about how their lesbian, gay, and bisexual movement has been co opted a lot yeah. by the trans and and queer community, and. To those people, particularly uh, homosexual men that, that I've spoken to, they are absolutely aghast at the blatant homophobia that is expressed by this trans rights activist. Which is which is what makes your video so pivotal, because I hear about these behaviours. I've actually never watched it, and then when I met with you on in the weekend, and you encouraged me to watch it, and I had to sit and watch it. It's quite uncomfortable. It's like, how is Simon dealing with this right in front of his face for like 10 minutes? I, I, I don't even want to watch this. But then it does, you know, confirm what I keep hearing about these behaviors that are disgusting, frankly, because you're filming in a public space, which you can do, and you can film at events. Um, there's no reason for someone to do that or behave in that way. And then the media call it as peaceful protests. Yes, there is that, <laughs> and, that, and that's it. And I, I think that's a big part of the motivation to do it is that that our our extremely left wing captured media simply will not ever sh show or tell the truth of these things. Yeah. Uh, but coming back to your previous point about um, the patients, you know, you'll have seen people saying, "Well, how did you how did you um, maintain your composure while you're being verbally assaulted and harassed and." Um, and abused like that, and uh, you know, I think that it's uh, it's better not to engage. I think that you know, having a camera in hand and affording uh, people the opportunity to 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 show the world who they are and the things that they th they think and the way that they want to behave is is a better approach. Um, I don't see an awful lot of point, you know, of of getting into a conversation with a person like that um, because it's inevitable that. Um, that it would be an argument and neither of us is, is likely to change the other person's mind. So it's, it's better to just simply not engage and to just observe events and allow people to e express themselves as they choose. Yeah, that's the way to go about it. And, you know, people's daily behaviours and activities define who they are. And you can clearly see in the video that you are the calm one there and having very civil, r you're responding to them, uh, um, minimal, but you're sort of speaking in very um, respectful manner and you're being informative and you are sort of confirming your free speech and your right to be there. And then sh he, not she, he is getting more and more aggressive. Uh, and then next thing you know, there is someone else that's wandering around in the scene and she's on the phone and she's on the phone with the cops. Yes. And the cops arrive while she's on the phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've never seen that sort of a fast response from the cops. No, indeed. indeed. <laughs> How did that play out? Uh, yeah, well, that, that was fascinating in itself. And, and this is uh, the rainbow special privilege that we have with two-tiered policing in New Zealand. Um, and... I should say that uh, you know I I'm, I don't consider myself to be a critic of the New Zealand police. I think that in general they do do uh, a, a very good job, mm. uh, but it is the case that they have been ideologically captured, partic particularly in the higher echelons of their organisation, by some of these some of this far left ideology, very much including 
uh, rainbow issues. So as as uh, I've, I've discussed previously, it, it's the case in New Zealand that if your home is burgled or if your business is ram raided, that the police may never turn up. Uh, but in contrast, the rainbow community have the police on speed dial. And as you say, you know, even before that lady put down the phone, uh, the police were there to just make sure that uh, that myself and the other photographer uh, had had not committed any crime. Yeah, it almost felt like they had already informed the police that this event was going ahead and they might call them in case something happens. And so the police must have been alerted that there's something going on. And so when the call went through, it almost felt like um, they already knew about it. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they did. And I, I would imagine that they're aware of a variety of events around. Um, yeah, I guess that's sort of their job. You know, it's big it gay out and this and that. And they kind of have to know what's going on. And Yes, and, and particularly uh, because we've had the, the um, pro-Israel and the pro uh, yeah. Palestine demonstrations that the police have had to manage over recent weeks and months um, with another event like this coming up there's the potential for uh, large groups of people to be to be coming into contact with one another that may lead to um, conflict and confrontation so I think the police are probably fairly well informed of those sorts of events yeah. and like to keep an eye on things. What do you mean by a two-tier system? What, why do you think the police favour the rainbow community more and respond to that instead of a burglary? Uh, well, I think it's it's ideological capture um, right. within the higher echelons of, of the police service. And it's certainly the case that that um, over the last six years of a, of a very, very uh, uh, left-wing Labour Green government that policing in this country has changed. Um, and I see that uh, that uh, Katrina Briggs uh, Biggs rather uh, released an article two days ago um, in response to an OIA response, pointing out that 0.8, almost one percent of everyone employed by the New Zealand Police Service, is dedicated. Their role is dedicated to forwarding rainbow issues, uh, and this shines through in the policing, and it certainly shined through in Albert Park last year where police um, didn't protect the women that were there at a, a ticketed event. Instead, they uh, uh, stood on the edges of the park and allowed the rainbow community to get stuck in and hurt people. Um, I think that this is reflective of the ideological capture of, of the police service. But with that said, I do get the, the impression that things are changing. And I know for a fact that frontline police uh, strongly object uh, to, to the, that sort of direction coming down from, um, from their bosses. Mm. You know, that's, that's interesting. Um, certainly, yeah, not an expert in anything to do with police, but I guess it's just like a, one of those things to kind of wonder what where it all went wrong because you you want public service to be service for all and for all issues and not one prioritized over the other especially what happened last year with Posse Parker's event ticketed event um, which is where your video capture was sort of the monumental piece of really shifting the narrative to what the mainstream media was reporting that it was peaceful and it was fine and it, it, it all went as it should and you know here we have some new heroes um and and little disregard to actually you know uh taking a woman's space and attacking women what made you decide to go and film that Oh, the Posey Parker thing. Yeah. Oh, really? I was just practicing with with my new camera, um, and I had no idea that it was it was about to make me overnight, instant, worldwide infamous. Uh, mm. You know, it's it's um it's an unusual thing to to suddenly go viral and for millions of people to to have seen uh, footage that you've published, particularly uh, which, as you say, directly contradicts the narrative that was being promulgated by. Uh, the media, um, who, by the way, still haven't released the footage that they shot 
uh, in Albert Park, a lot of it, uh, and also by um, the Labour and Green political parties, uh, both of whom had MPs on the ground participating in the, in that mob uh, who assaulted people. And yet, you know, 24 hours after those events, we had the police congratulating themselves on a job well done. We had the media uh, concocting an, an entirely fabricated narrative about how peaceful Albert Park was. And we had politicians, for instance, Chloe Swarbrick, uh, on on national TV talking about how it was just all love and araha, uh, which is the point that 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 my footage started getting published and the story changed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what did the story become from your perspective in your videos? How did that change the storyline? Well, it it really did because um, the the New Zealand media wouldn't touch it. Uh, although um, the international media would. So uh, I, I started getting contacted by international news agencies um, and, and news organisations wanting to use the footage and to interview me and that sort of stuff, um, none of which I did. I, I just I just pushed all the footage out there. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I refused all interviews, uh, just thinking. But you did give them access to your footage? Absolutely. Everything I've published is... is, yeah. is what, uh, They can see what's going on and they can write about it? Exactly right. And uh, it tells the story. And, and in the international media, what the story became was, um, was condemnation of New Zealand as a society uh, and particularly of the New Zealand media because the, the, the contrast, uh, for instance, Andrew Doyle, on uh, on GB News was doing pieces which were um, juxtaposing the footage of the violence that was occurring with what the New Zealand media was reporting, and it, the, the the dichotomy between the two of them just made New Zealand look ridiculous. So so one of the major criticisms from an international audience um, and international media organisations was just how awful our media was just how poorly our police had behaved and just how uh, uh, fictitious the narrative that our politicians was pushing. We, we, New Zealand as a society were, was deeply embarrassed on the international stage by those events. And I, I think that the, domest the domestic audience in New Zealand isn't quite aware of just how, how, how poorly uh, our, our country was portrayed. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. And I think... <clears throat> That's sort of like what I find so fascinating with uh, the state of news that New Zealanders have been consuming. <clears throat> it's something that I sort of kind of got awakened to from that COVID reporting. And it got to a point where Jacinda Ardern saying, her government is the only source of the truth. If you don't hear it from her, then it's not true. You know, and you just sit there and go, what the fuck did she just say? <laughs> yes, yes. You know? And <clears throat> then you all of a sudden realize what's going on. And then uh, you see the reports that are coming through from uh, citizen journalists like yourself on X give a much more clear view and the reality of New Zealand and what's going on which is then understood by the world as they see it versus to the legacy media reports that are coming in. Um, it's a much better New Zealand on X versus to New Zealand on stuff. Very true. That's quite a <laughs> contrast, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. uh, it is. And then, and then we have the young New Zealander of the year. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> yes. and I, I, I wrote a satire article on that the young terrorist New Zealander of the year, <laughs> uh, which was brilliant. Uh, and and th th that's the absurdity of life, right? The absurdity of the, the news. And it seems like my news story is probably more close to being real to that news story. But it's fascinating how it's all shifted where we ended up in a world somehow celebrating Hamas as a terrorist organization. How the fuck does that happen? Mm. And how do we mm. have members of parliament in New Zealand who earn $170,000 a year support a terrorist organization and not condemn their behavior 
and hide their behavior because they support a cause that they want to stay uh, in line with and not see the behaviors. So, so much of this is just kind of... How I know f- what you mean. And how the fuck do we end up with this reality? <laughs> yes, and I, I, I will say that I, I read your satire from some from time to time, and it, it it always makes me laugh. It's it's brilliant. You're 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 like New Zealand's version of 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 Babylon B. And often I'm reading your pieces, and it is you know it's a two paragraphs in before I realise that this is actually parody. And that's I think the sign of of good parody where yeah, it is actually believably to. true. Yeah, it has yeah. to be. It's a fine line. You have to pick certain components that make it fake. Yes. Which was my Christmas Day special of uh, the guy who threw ketchup sauce on uh, at Posse Parker. Yes. Um, it's a guy. It's yes. a man. Aliana Rabashkin. Yeah. And uh, how she comes in in it with a paraglider <laughs> into Chloe Zorbrick's Christmas party. And <laughs> that then, was fantastic. And then... Le- Crash lands on a tree and smacks back on the on the deck and in a bowl of ketchup sauce. Um, yeah, it's it's um, so it's 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 interesting. Like you you have to report it as if it's a real story. So when I start writing, I start writing with how the media is reporting the story. The headlines are similar. The first two paragraphs are similar. You you're basically giving the truth of what's happened, but then you just flick it around a bit and make make it this whole comedy piece. But you but I like to do them not for just getting a laugh. Oh I yes. like to do them with people really awakening to a truth, awakening to the absurdity, the irony of news, um, and um and really understanding that what you're consuming is actually not real. It's not the truth. It's a narrative. The brain is not interested in the truth. The brain is interested in what the brain wants to believe, and you've been fed a narrative. So you can consume my piece, which is not the truth, because it's fake news, but it's believable, <laughs> right? True, true. And I think that's the that's the like the important piece of why it's so it's so important to not just consume stuff and make that your reality and go make dis- life decisions based on what you're consuming in the news, but actually uh, focus on conversations like these ones. Uh, listening to people on X, watching the video, your, your videos directly from the source and see what's going on and the behaviors and, and things like this weekend, you can clearly see how that behavior can compound times 100 per- percent with what went on March last year with Posse Parker's uh, Yes, you can absolutely. You're you're exactly right. It's the it's the it's the same um, broad social trend uh, in action. It's like a microcosm of it. Um, but you you mentioned um, Hamas earlier, and uh, I I did want to have a, a quick chat about that because uh, it, it's it's the the, the the conflict in the Holy Land is um, is another wedge issue between left and w- left and right, uh, where you have um, people with a left wing ideology in New Zealand have adopted the Palestinian cause, um, and uh, an aspect of that is being prepared to overlook, as you say, some of the atrocities that Hamas has has pushed. Conversely. Um, on uh, on the right, you tend to find people that are uh, 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 tribally pro-Israel. What what um, what I think is really astonishing is I, I see particularly uh, Green Party MPs um, speaking at demonstrations and joining in the chants and those sorts of things, but which is which is their right which is their right to do, and and, and I certainly support. Um, their free speech, but I would be very surprised if you were to interview someone like Ricardo Mendes March or Chloe Swarbrook or Golris Garriman, and if you were to say, if you were to talk about, say, the Balfour Declaration or the King David Hotel or uh, um, Menachem Begin, Anwar Sadat, uh, any of those issues. Uh, they would be entirely 
unfamiliar with. Um, and the, the other aspect of it, which, which I find really fascinating, is that, is that I'm, I'm of the generation of people where, you know, uh, for, for most New Zealanders, Australians and, and South, Afri- uh, South Africans, the, the OE, the overseas ex- ed, uh, experience, is, is, is part of our culture where you get um, young Antipodeans who will go and spend a couple of years living in the United Kingdom and traveling Europe and doing those sorts of things. But back in the, the late 60s, um, 1970s, even into the 1980s, uh, a, a, a relatively common OE experience for left-wing uh, New Zealanders and Australians was to go and work on a kibbutz mm. uh, in Greater Israel. And by Greater Israel, I mean, um, you know, outside of not just the 1948 waters, but but the 1967. So you're talking about people who held very left-wing uh, views, uh, took a great deal of satisfaction in helping to build what they saw as a socialist experiment that was Israel uh, by contributing their labor at the time. And now we have this complete about face where here we are 40 years later mm. and uh, to, in, 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 uh, to the left-wing uh, uh, perception of the world, uh, you know, Israel is the bad guy and, and, and uh, Hamas is the good guy. Yeah, the issue in Israel and Palestine is a very contentious subject to discuss. And no matter how much you study the history and how much you go into the detail, you're always missing pieces to it. And it's very dangerous to form a very strong opinion based on missing pieces and ideologies and and firm positions that then misses all the other angles. That's essentially the, the reason why we have... A Green Party in New Zealand, members of Parliament in New Zealand, taxpayer-funded uh, people that uh, <clears throat> have very strong uh, support, uh, uh, a view of uh, supporting um, um, Palestine without realizing that the latest events was the cause of a terrorist organization. <clears throat> and the deeply rooted organization that's somehow getting funded to be so sophisticated and organize the attacks they're doing. Um, so you can go back to these main events, right? You can go back to World War II when uh, you know the world was looking for a land for the Jews. The Europeans didn't want them. The Brits didn't want them. America didn't want them. And they're like, well, actually, we want the land that we have history in. And, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, let's go take a piece of that and give you that. And then that becomes the the modern riff that's been going on for the last 75 odd years, right? It's a contentious subject to dis- uh, to discuss. Um, always gets out of hand, out of control, uh, but even gets more dangerous when you have uh, political parties that have very strong ideological view of what's happening and organizing thousands and thousands of protesters um, and infiltrating universities and cities and and really, you know, becoming, uh, which uh, a consequence of that is, uh, you know, uh, shifting the needle of what anti-Semitism is. All of a sudden, it's okay to be an anti-Semite. You know, it's, it's, it's a very contentious subject. And it's, even what I'm saying, full disclosure, is probably not the truth right i'm just trying to piece together and have an observation have a view and like you said chloe zorbrick coming to the podcast all of these people are invited i've reached out to them they're welcome to come on the show it's nothing to do about attacking people or you know it's important that the podcast is a platform where you have different type of conversations not just one-sided conversations um, you know, Debbie Narawa Packer, Packer, I was invited her. She didn't want to come because I supported David Seymour on something. You know, it's like, come on, you know, you gotta, you can't live in a society where you cancel conversations because we, we have different views, uh, because then you're just pretending to be happy or you're pretending to exist. Um, yeah, it's, it's a contentious subject. What's going on in Israel and Palestine and the, 
the latest event of, you know, all the funding that was going to that UN organization. Isn't that crazy? Yes. Did you hear about that? Yes, yes, I did with, with UNRWA. And yes, I, th- there have been issues from time to time. And, and uh, um, the, the, the specifics of that, I'm, I'm sure that the, that the truth will come out about that uh, yeah. all in due course. But I, I certainly concur with you that that um, the level of our discourse about these issues uh, is is reductio ad absurdum. Um, it is an intensely uh, complicated issue, as you say, and um, it should be, it, I think from, from a New Zealand perspective, um, the best that we can hope for is that uh, the, the lives of innocent people are protected. Beyond that, I don't see any value in us um, having those sorts of discussions and arguing with one another about an issue that we can't change. Yeah. So what's happening in Auckland CBD? How often do you film out there and what, what are you looking for? How do you go find events to film and how do you go about doing all of that? Uh, well, uh, often often I'm, I'm just wandering around with my camera. I, what I like to do is to to capture um, city scenes to give to give the audience a view of what's going on. Yeah, uh, I particularly like um, like to be presenting things that are lovely. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not joking. I, I really do. But but it's things like you know like um, uh, you'll see there'll be some young people that gather on a weekend and they dance together, yeah. and you know it's it's just fantastic to see things like that happening in our city. Um, but of course, what what's newsworthy tends to be much more sort of conflict and confrontational. So it's <coughs> it's stuff like uh, demonstrations and 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 what have you. Um, there's also there's also um, a little bit of uh, of um, how would you say moral obligation in in uh, and civic duty in that uh, there are some issues which, as you know, the media won't touch and um, it's to a large degree it's fallen to me to cover it instead. Yeah. Um, so it's things like, uh, you know, like after Albert Park, um, I started, uh, um, many of the victims contacted me and they were not being well served. Uh, they were being fobbed off by the police and so on. And these, these some of these women were, were deeply traumatised. Yeah. Uh, so an aspect of, of some of the things that I've been doing is is to help them uh, have their stories be told, help them navigate uh, navigate the bureaucracies and things like that, and to ensure that um, that all of these things are issues that that uh, are presented and within the public mind. So with that come that that um, in, uh, in in the background, um, there are a couple of court cases. Uh, concerning Posey Parker, which which I've been covering, um, and to be fair, that um, some other media have as well. Um, chaps like uh, like uh, Philip Crump at uh, News Talk ZB Plus uh, has been uh, uh, has been very good at um, keeping an eye on things, get some coverage on the platform, and so on. So there is a little bit and. Um, uh, also, uh, reality check radio organisations like that, and yourself, that are a little bit more keen to be even-handed and actually tell the story uh, that the mainstream media won't. Yeah, it's changing, man. It's it's um, <clears throat> it's it's a new world, thanks to X. You know, thanks to X, it's a new world, um, and I'm very excited to see so many New Zealanders come on the platform share stories, do the news, do it in a way that um, people share news, you know. Before all these media organizations and mainstream media organization, news used to be such a local thing, and it was through conversations, through people, you know, capturing things that they're interested in, you walking around with a camera, and you capturing beautiful things in the city, and then all of a sudden there are bad things happening in the city, and then you're like, well, you know, why is the media not capturing that? I've got a responsibility. It's my community. It's my city. It's my, you know, it's a society that I want to contribute to. Um, and that's sort of the exciting thing that I find about what's going on with X um, and what's going on with X in New Zealand and how it's being used and how it's providing the news. Um, 
uh, which is which is super awesome. Oh, I think so too, and I I, th- I think it's the the rise of citizen journalism is enabled yeah. by X and its free speech approach to social social media. Um, and and I recently said, you know, that 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 we the people are the media now, and to a large extent that's true. And a large part of what I try to do is to say to people, look, you know. You have the facility in your pocket. All you need to do is you see something happening, pull out, pull out your phone and film it and, yeah. and, you know, get it out there because that sort of hyper-local coverage of things as they happen uh, is, is unbiased. It tends to be neutral. You show the footage, you let people make up their own minds. You know, and, and it's, it's arisen um, over 20 20 to 30 years, you, you, like you'll remember there were shows like, um, there were shows back in the 90s, you might be too young to remember, um, there was a show called uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, right, so, yeah. so you, have, you have people and they've, they've, you know, it tended to be Americans who had, you know, early VHS video cameras and things like that who happened to be filming and something funny would happen, you know, the cat would jump over the dog or what have you, right? Yeah. And they made a whole show about it and people found it interesting. Yeah. But then, you know, you sort of fast forward into the early 2000s and you have the very best coverage of um, the planes flying into the World Trade Center is people who happen to be filming, right? Yeah. You know, that, that is the seminal coverage of really core critical events that changed our world and they're not coming to us from the media they're happening because someone had the presence of mind to pull out their 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 phone and start filming so you know if there's one thing the audience takes away from this podcast please please if you see something happening film it yeah yeah it's 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 a It's a it's a beautiful thing to do. I think there's there's a saying that goes: Imagine if your life was filmed twenty four seven. How would how would you behave? Uh, the psychological mind would say you would try to live a higher self. True. If you were l- filmed, so getting comfortable with filming and and creating content and not just consuming it and being comfortable with the stick that comes with it, you know, it's also an important piece, and that's why a lot of people don't do it. <clears throat> and um, it's something that really should be taught in school in getting kids comfortable with uh, uh, being part of media, create content. I do it with my kids, you know. We have podcast conversations that are not recorded. Yes. Right? That's a wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful. They're just, you know, I, I'll have my 70-year-old join me in a conversation and he's getting comfortable with the camera you know, that's fantastic. And the voice, you can hear his sound and back and forth. <clears throat> um, it's a good way to get kids comfortable. And obviously kids watch so much reality TV on YouTube. Other kids creating content. You know, there's Ryan's world. He makes $40 million a year on YouTube. He's a six-year-old. Wow. You know, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them on YouTube. So my son's, you know, it's like, Dad, when are you going to buy me a camera? I want to, you know, go and film what I do and this and that. I want to put it on YouTube. So it's it's kind of, it's it's getting there. But, you know, we we, we want to see more of that. And, and you're, you're very right in terms of how uh, since the early 2000s, the most important moments have been captured by people just picking up their phones, taking a video. The best one that's happened this year was the video of a Jew coming out of a tunnel. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, oh my goodness. How good that, was that? Oh, that, uh, a Hasidic Jew, I think, was. I is, I is that the. I have no idea. Uh, right. And he was, he was climbing up, uh, yeah, in New York City. Yeah, is, outside right. a synagogue. Is it, right. Yeah. And it's, it's just. Some passerby takes out his phone and films this Jew coming out of a tunnel like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I just yes, I I saw that video and I'd 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 um I'd, I'd, I I don't I haven't had a television for an awfully long time, so it's the case that I often I miss out on the zeitgeist of things. Um, you know, for instance, I, I'd be pretty sure that I've never heard a Taylor Swift song. Yeah, uh, but. It's only because people say, "Oh, hey, have you seen this, that, and the other thing?" And I hadn't followed the story of of the the tunnels in New York at all. And then someone sent me that video. Yeah, I was like, "Mike, 
my goodness, what am I actually looking it's at here? This chat uh, uh, emerge, and yeah. and then you dig into the story, and it's it just seems crazy. <laughs> I mean, you know, for someone like me who doesn't watch the news yeah. on TV and things, this is, <laughs> and I'm catching up with the story. I'm thinking this. It's this, crazy. This can't be true. Yeah. So this, there's just some guy walking past sees a Jew guy, a Jew coming out of a tunnel. He films it, put it on Instagram, goes viral, and then the cops are called in. They're like, "Well, you know, there's something going on here. There's a lot of Jews coming out of a tunnel," and they get into the synagogue. And there's a lot of like um, people filming on the video. There's a huge hole in the wall, and there's a, a, a lot of Jews holding this dirty. Um, mattress to block it and then the Jews are fighting with the cops <laughs> it's brilliant it's just it's just astonishing it's and brilliant yes, it's, yeah. it, you, you, it's one of those circumstances where you think this it, um, it sounds like a conspiracy theory like when it's being yeah. explained yeah, to yeah, you it's it, satire it's, like it's, it's yes. like this can't be true and this is all happening right in the midst of a debate about Who's built all these tunnels under hospitals in Gaza? Yes. Is it the Israels yes. or is it is it you know? And then you have Jews running an underground tunnel network in the middle of New York. Uh, it's brilliant. It was. I I did catch uh, an interview with um with the rabbi, uh, uh, who was who was very you know I mean, of course obviously um, embarrassed about uh, about how it had made their congregation look and. Things like that, and um, uh, my heart went out to him. And that uh, you could see that he was very much caught in the middle of events that he that he didn't have an awful lot of control over. Um, and of course, while this is happening, you have so much media influence, or rather media perspective from one side or the other, saying, you know, concocting using these events to concoct a broader narrative. Which is tenuous at best, and um, all of those sorts of things are uh, yeah. interesting. In yeah, yeah. You know, I as a kid, I used to love the National Geographic magazines, and the most iconic one is the the picture of the Afghani girl with oh, green eyes. Isn't she beautiful? You know, beautiful and I, I love that kind of journalism of these National Geographic photographers would go around the world. They captured the real news. They did. Have you seen the um, the photograph of her? Yeah, it's astonishing. He's gone that, back and found her uh, uh, and uh, taken uh, the photo of her. Now uh, I think she was in this new latest photo, maybe forty five, fifty years old. It's incredible the contrast between the two of them, isn't it? Yeah, and you can, and and I I found that um, you know uh, really touching that that that. That poor girl, she was just so beautiful in that photograph. And, and you young see, and excited about the life right. and what life is. And that's, you know, it's a beautiful thing about life. As we are kids, we are, this, you know, we are awakened to life and we're excited and everything is, you know, and then we go through life and you, you, you can capture someone's emotions and experiences of life, you know, once they're like 45, 50. Yes. It's fascinating. And, mm, and it was obvious that she'd lived... A very very hard life after that photograph yeah. was taken, and the juxtaposition between those two photographs is really quite startling. Yeah, yeah, I love that kind of journalism, that that sort of um, capturing real news, yes. capturing real stories just through an image, mm, through a video. Something. It's not edited. It's not a Netflix documentary with that's run through a script that's has a bias of a story they're telling. It's just captured purely by an individual and there is so much truth in that image that tells the story you don't have to write about. I, I couldn't agree more. It's There's a magnificence in our world and there are some times when a photographer will capture that in a single image and it's startlingly beautiful and certainly that photograph is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, it is. The other one that um, the other near uh, National Geographic uh, photograph that a lot of people comment upon is Kevin Carter's uh, photograph in Africa of um, of the young girl uh, crawling towards a United Nations aid station um, while a vulture waits for her to collapse. Do you know that photograph? No, tell me. Uh, well, it's it's quite terrible. Um, 
there's a vulture circling someone waiting for her to collapse and then go go like yeah shall i dig it out you you really should see this photograph yeah sure do you want to see it it okay hang on um everyone vultures are interesting did you know that in mongolia i believe they have this uh vulture uh ceremony that they feed the dead to the vultures have you ever heard of that no yeah it's I, i think it's mongolia i'm pretty sure one of those crazy countries. It's actually a ritual. They, yeah, feed the dead to the vultures. Oh. Fuck. So it's, it's, it's a really startling photograph that she's, she's a couple of kilometers short of a United Nations aid station and she's about to die and the vulture knows it uh, and, and is... is doing what vultures do. Um, now, Kevin Carter, um, there's quite a story behind that photograph and that, that, that as soon as it was published, Kevin Carter was, um, uh, I think he might have won a Pulitzer for it. Uh, he certainly won some sort of award. Uh, but he also took an awful lot of criticism for, for no longer being, for, well, for maintaining um, his position as a photographer, as a neutral uh, observer as opposed to actually intervening and and helping the little girl and in fact he he was he was confronted by the this question um for the rest of his life which wasn't very long did he did he step in to help he never said whether he did or not mm. and um and uh eventually uh, um unalived himself not long afterwards in his in his uh, mid 30s um uh, largely because of the, the the consequence of that photograph. So wow, it's, it's uh, th- there is a lot of photography like that, and and you know you look at Life magazine to a lesser extent, Time, certainly National Geographic. Uh, some of the imagery um, that they've produced has just been has been monumentous like that. Yeah, yeah, I love a lot of the videos that are in you know a lot of David Attenborough documentaries oh, yes. about life and uh, plants and animals and um, <clears throat> you know videos of how nature actually works that you know animals are very very you know cruel they they go for it they okay. kill and they they so you know we talk we, we're talking about like you know the war that humans create is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it ideology? Is it misinformation? Is it history? Is it is it bending the truth? Is it you know um, all of that stuff? You know why would uh, a terrorist organization decide to attack civilians? And then um, <clears throat> why would Israel decide to overreact and go kill a lot of civilians? And all of that stuff is a you know why do we do that is it nature or is it a, a, a consequence of how society is structured um you know i'd argue that a lot of it is nature um and just look at the chimpanzee um species these guys fucking fight yes yeah, so that the was chimpanzee it ju- civilization these guys <laughs> fucking they the murders they cause and the tribes that take over I wish somebody go and film them. Wasn't there a documentary on Netflix? The uh, what is it called? The Chimp Empire. Uh, I, I didn't see that, but I think it was Jane Goodall. You know, who's the the Jane Goodall's the um, the um, researcher into uh, uh, primate behaviour who spends an awful lot of time in Africa. Wow. And I think it was her who did um, the Great Chimp War. Did you see that? No, where? I haven't seen that. Okay, so it was about maybe thirty years ago where uh, there, there there were two tribes of Trump chimps that uh went to war with each other mm. and as you say you know it was really barbaric like oh. th- that that they they behave like this and it was almost as also as you say it's almost proto-humanoid behavior where okay we're one group we're another group and uh you know it's it's gloves off total war yeah and chimps are 99.8 percent similar to the human dna <laughs> yes but so are bananas <laughs> <laughs> I, I read that somewhere. Something like Is that bananas. True? Yeah, bananas share something like ninety-eight point seven percent of the same 
uh, uh, DNA as humans. So we're eating humans when we eat bananas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not quite, but you know, it's uh, the genetic similarities of carbon-based life forms. Ah, yeah, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. And videos are fascinating. There's just so much story out there that's captured in film um, about life and what goes on. Yes, and, and so much which is missing as well. Yeah, a um, lot of it is missing. And that's what I love what's going on with X. There's so much videos and some of it is very disturbing. But it's what's missing. It's what's not being reported by media. It's so much of the news is being cut out because it doesn't fit a narrative. Very true. Very true. And uh, and as you say, that's that's the advantage of uh, citizen journalism is that, you know, you, you see the raw material uh, uh, presented, um, hopefully, from which you can form your own conclusions, mm. uh, which the media is very much disinclined to allow the audience to do. Uh, but that said, uh, I, I, I am quite a sensitive soul and, and I do find some of the material um, on X to be... Um, to be very, very disconcerting. You know, I, I really don't like to see um, people coming to harm and some of the the war porn that we've been getting um, out of the Holy Land, out of Ukraine and things like that is is just terrible. And yeah, I, it just, I think it, 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 do, it does shake you up for sure. And really we're not does. used to it. And that's probably why, you know. I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. But, you know, I'd... Um, yeah, but I, yeah, it's just yes. I, I particularly don't don't like to see uh, to see people um, uh, coming to harm. And and uh, uh, yes, it's uh, there are times when I just know that if if I if I go on to X, that there's been some sort of world event where terrible things have happened, and and uh, you know, yeah, I uh, find it difficult. Yeah, but I, I think it's an important piece. You have to confront yourself with that. You you have to see videos of illegal immigrants beating up civilians on the street you know there's a video that i watched of an illegal immigrant in italy just you know beating the crap out of this woman and oh, yeah. tearing her yeah. shirt off and there are uh, civilians just sitting on the street watching it happen it's like what are you guys doing and then you see all the illegal immigration that's going on in this in the states and the west border and they're coming in the thousands and they're all being put in a bus and shipped to new york because New York is all about supporting them. It's like, oh, you have them then. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that's I think that's great. I, I I think it's just that was just so wonderful um, as a response. Yeah, it's, from yeah. the governors of Texas and yeah. Florida and those southern yeah. states to say, okay, well, if you're a sanctuary city, I think is the term that they use to say that they're, yeah. they're refugee friendly, uh, which I don't th I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, um, but the response of um, putting uh, asylum seekers and recent arrivals onto planes and buses and sending them places like Martha's Vineyard and and New York City. <laughs> I just thought that was genius. It's just yeah, because it's fair enough, right? To to share the burden, right? Like you know, it's yeah. very easy if you're in the northeast of the United yeah. States to say, look, Texas, this is your problem to deal with, but you've got to deal with it and you've got to accept this. You know, that's not how countries work. No. Right? Like, you know, the burden needs yeah, to be You can't just sit shared. in New York and be like, hey, open borders, we got to accommodate all these people. Okay, it's comfortable for you to say, how about we send some to you in a bus? Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and But the other thing is that I've seen the reaction to that now within uh, some of those liberal American states is uh, that, uh, you know, the Democrat, Democrat uh, Party-run cities and states have started uh, ad adopt a refugee program. Have you seen any of those programs? Um, no, no. I'm well, you're going to love this. So, so what the what the, what the Democrats have been doing is saying, look, you know, if you've got a spare room in your home, we've got we don't have enough uh, places and shelters. So, if I you can adopt a refugee, that. right? Well, some of the videos are great because there's there's one which which, <laughs> which I'll send to you because I. I, I I, I really shouldn't laugh, but it was a, a woman who had taken in uh, a, a lady from, I think, P Peru, perhaps, or perhaps Ecuador, that sort of part of South America. Yeah. And the, the, this uh, American lady, the host family, was, um, was talking about how great it was to, have, um, to be having some home-cooked meals 
and to have some help with the cleaning and so on. And while she was talking about how lovely it was to host this woman, the, 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 the video footage was of this woman uh, working for her effectively, cooking meals, doing the dishes, cleaning stuff. And the comment from the person presenting it was, well, look at this. The Democrats have actually reintroduced slavery in the United States. And it really was. Like, you could see that this woman had just just she was just completely using this poor immigrant lady <laughs> as free labor you know oh. it was just it was just astonishing and um oh, it reminded me of a, a quote from family guy where there was a, there was an episode of family guy where they're going back through through old family photographs and 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 one of the photographs was a picture of a of a black gentleman yeah and and the comment was well who's this oh that was just a chap um that we gave food and lodging to in exchange for a few chores. Yeah. Meaning a slave. And that's effectively what is what is happening in these yeah. liberal cities. But wouldn't that be like au pairs? Au pairs kind of work in that structure, isn't it? Uh, they do, um, but I think uh, that's that tends to be a little bit more formalised and okay. contracted. Uh, you know, okay. like with an au pair, it's, it's a proper employment agreement. Um, yeah. typically through an agency. Certainly that's how it works in New yeah. Zealand. But Yeah, well, what are you going to do with an illegal immigrant that you've given them a spare room? Like, what are you going to do with them? Like, uh, you know, like, maybe help them find a job. You can't do that. Send them to school. You can't do that. What do you do with them? Yeah, make, it's, it's, let them make food for you and clean your house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is just, uh, it just is terrible when you look at it like that. But, um, yeah. you know, Gary Lineker, the footballer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I understand that, that he took in um, a, a, a refugee for a, a brief period, uh, long enough for a headline. I don't think it was too much, too much longer than that. So there, there's, there's an aspect of performative caring about it, I think, um, for some of these people. It's like, look, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. look how, look, look what a lovely person I am because, because I'm yeah, doing this. Yeah, it's an, a, a lot of the reason why people do charities for selfish reasons. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, I and think so. that's why they do charity. Well, that's why these famous people do charity. It's all, you know, it's all just selfish reasons to kind of get themselves in that status game, that status position, you know. It's like, um, like, Trevor Mallard, why would he be a sir? Oh, yes, a knighthood for Trevor <laughs> you know, Mallard. Goodness. It's like, what the fuck? But that's, that's, yes. just, that's the status game. You, you get in yourself in these positions, Speaker of the House. What the fuck? Like, why, why would a Speaker of the House be, you know? I don't know. Anyway, uh, but, but, but that's, that's kind of like the... Um, if you want to give somebody respect for what they've done you give it to the person who created the river of freedom documentary that captures people protesting outside the pa uh, the the parliament for their freedom not the guy who's blasting music at them <laughs> yes yeah. that's true and and um there is an aspect of that and uh, there's often an awful lot of criticism of those um uh, of the of the of the appointments and um and the New Zealand honours system, uh, because it has been deeply politicised by the, particularly the Labour Party, who have used it to pump um, specific ideologies, and and they've chosen some some fairly awful people um, to receive them, including Jacinda Ardern. Uh, you know, it's 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 typical for a New Zealand Prime Minister to receive a knighthood uh, at the end of their tenure. That that typically happens, but. What also typically happens is to to avoid uh, uh, any perception of impropriety that there is a delay until the um, opposition party is in office. So, for instance, uh, it's unusual for a Labour prime minister to be awarded uh, a Labour a, a knighthood by uh, a Labour government. Typically, it would be awarded by a national government. Mm. However, in Ardern's case it was rushed through with um, with unseemly haste simply because uh, the, the Labour government would have been aware that the National Party, a national-led government, particularly one featuring David Seymour and Winston First Act and, and New Zealand First, 
uh, Winston Peters, sorry, I'm afraid I called him Winston first, uh, with those three parties, they would be more likely to say, well, hang on a second, uh, is, is Jacinda Ardern, R. Trevor Mallard, people like that really deserving of, of a New Zealand honour. Um, another aspect to consider is that, um, is that National is much more aware of the position that it puts the sovereign in and that, you know, the, the, the right to appoint an individual uh, to the New Zealand Order of Merit or to the Order of New Zealand or indeed pretty much any other uh, order within the Commonwealth uh, is the with an exclusive gift of the sovereign. It's done on the recommendation of a, a subcommittee of cabinet, but if the wrong person is appointed, it's the sovereign who looks bad. Yeah, which I'm pretty sure it did because everyone was pretty pissed off. Yes, yes. Well, it's it's things like you know Jimmy Jimmy Savile, right, or Ron Briley. You know, when when an individual has their knighthood stripped from them for 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 poor behaviour, it's uh, it's it's very much a bad look, and it, it calls the whole system uh, um, into question. Mm-hmm. It does. <clears throat> what else is happening that uh, you are planning to film? <laughs> well, um, uh, the 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 chap who is accused of pouring tomato juice over uh, Kelly Jane King Mitchell, uh, Posey Parker. Um, he has, well, there's a hearing in his case coming up um, at the end of this month. So there'll be uh, some, there'll be some potential coverage in that, uh, whether or not he chooses to change his plea from innocent to guilty. If not, then he'll be committed to trial. So there'll be some news around that. Uh, and the other thing is that in early March, around about the 7th, um, the granny basher, the, the young chap who seriously assaulted the lady in Albert Park, uh, is due for sentencing. Um, and uh, his victim will be in attendance in, here in Auckland for that. So there will be some, uh, there'll be some coverage around those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, I'll, and I'll be I'll be trying to cover those. I'm, I'm a little bit constrained in one regard, and in, in one of those cases, um, I'm a potential witness, and uh, I've previously made uh, an application to the judge for access uh, to the court so that I can um, I can see what's going on. But I've been specifically by name prohibited from doing that um, because I could be called as a witness. I mean, I doubt I ever will be, but um, it's effectively being used to. Uh, to keep independent journalists such as myself um, at arm's length. <clears throat> Interesting. So can you object that? Can you still go film it? Are you going to film it or what are you going to do? Uh, well, I can't. Well, um, I've, I've, I've taken advice from um, from uh, my own barristers and uh, from other uh, uh, lawyers that I know uh, who've said, look, you know, that um, if you're interested in, excuse me, If you're interested in allowing justice to take its course, and I very much am, I, I believe in the judicial system, um, it is better to stay away absolutely so that there's no uh, sense of impropriety of, of you being there. So um, when um, the court cases around Rubashkin are, uh, are being undertaken, um, I won't be anywhere near the vicinity. However, uh, I do know people who will and... <coughs> And excuse me, I'll be using my my social media reach to uh, to well, how, however little that is to uh, push out um, the reports and any video footage that they yeah. they capture. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, are you going to record Gul Reese's uh, court? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sort of in two minds about that, and I've, um, I am in. I, I I sort of put this out there that you know that um, that, that uh, I really am in two minds, and I, I asked people whether or not I should, and and the consensus view was that yes, it's going on, it's newsworthy, um, you should cover it, yeah. um, and, and and there's an aspect of that, but I'm I'm also very conscious that that uh, you know that, that there's a human being at the centre of this. Um, and that <coughs> she's already paid a very, very high price for things um, and mistakes that she's made. 
I think that uh, affording her the opportunity to to get on with the rest of her life, there's an argument in favour of that. And and the other thing, the other aspect that I'm I'm very very conscious of with someone like that is that uh, you know she she comes from um, she comes from a, a, a fairly conservative background. Uh, you know, one of her parents is is uh, Sunni, the other is Shia. Um, that they you know they they're they're people who would want the best in life for their daughter as every parent does um who have been deeply embarrassed by these things and i think that um that a certain amount of ca compassion um should be directed uh towards the individual also conscious that uh that in the background there's a family there who 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 are uh, who are traumatized by these sorts of things? Yeah, good on you, man. I think that's the that's a good way of looking at it. Is that is a justice system, and justice system is about making sure people who have been harmed get justice, but also the people that have caused harm have a pathway to uh, redemption. Redemption, and um, <clears throat> uh, in her case, she's already you know taken so much of that brunt of it. And, um, you know, she's spoken about what's happened and how she's going to uh, redeem herself. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people would not give her an inch because of her stance and, and you know, her position that she's taken and, and being a lawyer and, and, you know, fighting for bringing justice to people that have been um, done wrong. And then she finds herself in that position, um, but no, it's a uh, yeah. There's argument for both the sides. There are. It's it's quite a moral you know? conundrum. And so then the question becomes, uh, what position does an independent journalist like yourself take, um, and um, where do you balance that? Uh, the right thing to do from a human perspective, and being conscious of. Uh, family and the harm that you know the more harm on already inflicted wound may cause versus to you have to do the news yes there's that and and that's that's the consensus is that um that i should present it neutrally as i as i tend to do i think that the only issue where i i don't typically my approach is i put material out there and say look you know this is it. I pr I'm presenting it neutrally. Make up your own mind. Um, the the issue where I I I tend to actually allow my own uh, point of view to to come through is around um, the trans rights activists. Uh, just because there's on one hand you have uh, presenting things neutrally and balanced, but then on the other you have an obligation to tell the truth of things and the, the truth of, of of things in their case is that they behave terribly and they're a threat to our democracy. And I, I'm not. I, I don't pull back from expressing that, but where Golris is concerned, the consensus is that that I should I should present present the footage and 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 report upon it, um, because you you know how things go. Like what, once your 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 journalistic credentials have been accepted, um, there there is information available via the Ministry of Justice that is not available to the general public. Things like, like uh, agreed uh, statements of facts and and so on and so forth, which journalists use as the source material, and um, having access to that is one thing, and being able to report upon it. And some of the reporting that I've seen around that has been has been fair and balanced. And and I'm more than happy to participate in that and say, look, you know, okay, here is here's what's happened in court. Here's what was said. This, that, and the other thing, you know, that's 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 fairly reasonable. But I think what a lot of people expect from me is for me to be rocking up there with my camera and to do perp walk footage of you know her looking downtrodden, coming yeah. to court, going out of court, looking like the perpetrator, and and that sort of thing. And and I'm not sure, like while that while there's there are some people that would take a certain amount of satisfaction from that, and while and while it is. The truth of the story that the media will never show. I'm I'm not necessarily convinced that it's um that it's a right and proper approach. <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's it's. I get it. I get it. It's 
<clears throat> it's a tough it's a tough one, right? Because you know the Greens, they are just so terrible. You know they're 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 anti democratic. Um, they're they're authoritarian in their approach. Their extremist views on a huge number of issues, everything from free speech through to uh, international relations and race relations, capitalism, all of those things. You know that they they really are an ex, ex, existential threat to civilization, in my opinion. <laughs> and Sociopaths. the opportunity, <clears throat> yes, the opportunity exists to crucify Golras, to make the point. Well, look, you know. Here is one of these people who's been telling you what to do and telling you what to think and telling you how much better the life would be, your life would be, if you just let her make all of your decisions for you. Yeah. And she's misbehaved, and by crucifying her, it could do damage to their ideology. So there's, there are people who are looking yeah. to use her for that. And I think the mistake that you might make is you're giving her an inch. And if you give her that inch, it's what the Argentinian president talks about and i posted a video of him it's like you if you give these fucktards an inch they'll fuck you up they will take a mile they yes. will they will they will you know so that's the thing it's like if we're going to give her an inch which is what the media has been doing and then the prime minister comes and says oh it's tough for a woman to be in parliament it's like whoa what are you doing i voted for you man what the fuck are you doing <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah and that's true that, that, you know? That that is true, and and, and that is that is a, a very solid counter argument, um, particularly because if if she was, as we know, if she, she was, she's going to come back. I think she possibly will, um, but if she was Erica Stanford, for instance, from the National Party, or oh jeez, Brooke Van Velden oh, yes. from ACT, yeah, good luck. The 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 media would have absolute. They, they wouldn't have them. left her alone. It would be wall to wall coverage, twenty four hours a day. Yeah. For weeks, if not months, and so there is a fair and balanced aspect, I think, to that. But but my own approach is is I sort of think of of Golras as being kind of yesterday's news. You know, she's 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 gone now. She her her potential to impact uh, our affairs um, is at least for the time being non-existent, and a better focus of our attention is those who are in a position to influence things, the, the likes of Chloe Swarbrook. And, and you may have seen that I've been pushing out some videos that I've created of, of, of interspersing footage of, uh, of the violence that the communities she is so keen to, to promote commit, uh, inter interspersed with her talking about how that violence actually didn't happen. Yeah. And what I've been trying to do is to, to sort of push like, look, you know, listen to what, these people say what Julianne Genta says, what Chloe Sprawlbrook or um, Ricardo uh, Mendez March. The, the ideology that these people are pushing—they're not—they're not hiding it. They're—they're—they're they're, they're literally telling us that they don't believe in capitalism and democracy, and they want those things to go away. And I think that they are much more worthy of attention than 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 yeah. someone who's who's now gone burger. What do you see the danger of Chloe Sprawlbrook? Well, she's um, she is actually smarter than she appears, and um, she's uh, she she does have the the art of ret rhetoric. Um, but I think that my greatest concern is that she's an ideologue who is absolutely, utterly convinced of her own righteousness. And if history has taught us anything, it's that we ought to be very, very uh, cautious when we're dealing with people who cannot be convinced that they are anything other than 100% correct. And, and, and she's one of those people. And um, the, the, the other concern I have is that uh, but beyond her demagoguery, which she's very good at, is just how massive her constituency is amongst young people. It, yeah. they, re they love her to bits. It's, it's the next generation. Um, it's the consequence sure. of fucking universities having these, it um, is. you know, it is. Um, uh, 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 narratives that kids have felt. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, most people that go to university have that experience. But for some reason, what's happening now, it's like next level. 
you know, what we've seen with Harvard University, for example, and the, the anti-Semitism and the presidents that just don't have the ability to actually say... Plagiarism. Yeah, plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, so I feel like, uh, you know, the likes of Chloe will be, you know, doing a, 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 a successful job in getting the minds, getting into the minds of these young people and pushing a narrative... And that's why they want to legalize voters from the age of 16. Yes. Because they know that they can get to them. It's like, no, maybe we should shift the voting to 21. Yes, that's probably 25, yeah, 25, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I think so. Bring in an IQ test. Yeah. Um, yeah, all of those sorts of good things. <laughs> Did you see that uh, Joe Biden doesn't wa- is not going to do a cognitive test? I, I feel very sorry for that man. I, I, I mean, it's it's obvious that his his cognitive. There's some really good footage about him tripping on stairs. Uh, yes, it's oh goodness, it's just well, it's it's um, it, it's been obvious for a long time that uh, yeah, well, he's he's an older gentleman, and uh, I think that he's had a lifetime in public service, and it's it's a case of God, when can your servant rest? You know, he should just he should retire gracefully out of the public public eye because at the moment he's uh, he's an object of derision and uh, and sympathy yeah i think if he if if you never know whether it's the truth or not the truth or he might be much more better conditioned than what it's projected in the videos that we watch and the videos that are edited on social media you know all about that um <clears throat> But the worst scenario is he's having a debate on national television with Donald Trump. I can't see that working out very well. Yeah, yeah. If you can't remember the years that you were the VP, it's 2008 to 2014 or 16. You were there for eight years. I mean, how can you not remember being the VP? (laughs) It really is quite astonishing, isn't it? Oh, mm. it's it's gonna be an interesting. I I, I do think he's gonna lose. Or he's either gonna retire or he's gonna lose. I, I I don't think. I think it's Americans have come to realize that the world was better when Trump was the president. And I mean, you know, we talk about the narratives that are used by media and the videos they create and and how that machine attacked Trump and you know for for all sorts of different reasons. But a lot of Americans agree that uh, a lot of his policies were effective and the world was better before that. And, yes, if, and even the, the, the Democrats are realizing this whole ideology of uh, diversity, e- equality, inclusion, open borders. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's gone too far. They don't even believe it themselves. And it's the same thing with uh, my body, my choice. You know, you talk to any Democrat, it's like, well... Uh, is it? Do you really believe in this? Like, how many abortions before it's 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 like you've got a fucking issue? You don't know how to put a condom on, right? <laughs> it's probably three. Yes. Like if you have more than yes. three abortions and you're having one every year or every three months or every six months, like, what the fuck is what the fuck are you doing? Yes. You yes. know. So all of this stuff is just like ideology, and it sounds great. It's like, you know, Obama stuff. Like, yes, we can, and you know, all that kind of just. It's not. It's not reality. No, it isn't. Or be kind. That's the one that always gets me. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, why did you use those words on my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. But oh. you kind of opened the door when you said uh, you 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 um, quoted Jacinda Ardern's "We are your single source of truth." Yeah. Well, that inspired the single source, which is. Ah, of course, it did too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there it is. good connection, good connection. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I did a uh, post on X asking for recommendations for the name and the single source was put on. I was like, yep. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And guess what the email uh, address is for the contact person at the single source? I can't. Tell me. Jacinda. <laughs> <laughs> Jacinda at singlesource.co.nz. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and I have the signature in it as well. So when right. I get inquiries, I just respond back. To, and, just, and then people respond back going, thanks, Jacinda. 
<laughs> Chet, would you mind? I, I'm good. I've got to use the restroom. Yeah, we'll take yeah, a break yeah. For a take a minutes. break. Yeah, restroom okay. break, everyone. We're back from a quick um, toilet break. Sorry about that, everybody. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> what else has been happening? Uh, well, there, there's the, the IPCA stuff is coming up. Um, oh, yeah. What's that? So the, the, uh, the Independent Police Complaints Authority uh, launched an investigation into uh, the police response to the Posey Parker uh, uh, riot last year and, and the events surrounding that. Um, that report was due to be uh, published in February, around about now, and that, that was the expectation that was set by, by the investigators. Um, and uh, it was announced uh, about a week ago that that has that the inquiry has broadened and uh, that there will be a delay until June for publication of that. And what's quite fascinating is that that I was one of the people um, interviewed as part of their inquiries. They interviewed me maybe about three months ago, and and your audience can can hear a recording of my testimony uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, but because I, I'm I'm a witness, uh, I'm due to be uh, provided with an embargoed copy of their report pr- uh, prior to to general publication. Uh, but I wasn't informed that there was going to be a delay in that. Uh, none of the witnesses were the the complainants and the victims from Albert Park uh, were contacted by the IPCA, and uh, a couple of them contacted me to say well look you know we've we've been informed that there is there is this delay and that the the there's a broad the IPCA is taking a broader approach now for for the victims of Albert Park their perspective is that the IPCA intends to whitewash what happened by saying well look you know rather than the specific issues of um, how uh, the police represented the rainbow communities interests as opposed to the broader interests of New Zealand society in Albert Park they're taking a, a broader perspective to say well look you know there are some issues with the way that police handle demonstrations in general um, I, I'm inclined to think that that is probably right and the, the IPCA as an organization does have a history of being um, fairly pro-police rather than being um, fairly even-handed and pro-justice, I think I think that's probably a, a reasonable criticism. Uh, and I would also say that I've attended quite a few demonstrations uh, over the last twelve months. Everything from co-governance through to pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, uh, rainbow issues, what have you. And <clears throat> with the sole exception of uh, Albert Park, I've seen the police perform a very very good job. I don't think that there are many criticisms that can be leveled against them for the way they have done that. Although you may have seen that um, I've interviewed two people, uh, two pro-Israel counter-demonstrators at the pro-Palestine demonstrations, um, uh, Daniel and Lucy. Um, I've just, you know, five quick five-minute interviews with the two of them. I think that... Um, that you know th- their arrests uh, are worthy of investigation. I think I think that's 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 a fair outcome. But I I personally don't believe that it should be rolled up into the very specific issues uh, around Posey Parker and and Albert Park. Wow, that's fascinating. <clears throat> and what 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 do you think will be the outcome of this investigation, or what do you? I I think it's hard to say. I. Th- I, th- I think that uh, by broadening the inquiry, uh, the, it seems to me likely that the IPCA intends to obfuscate some of the issues. I think some of the questions um, around Albert Park are really, really specific. Like who, who gave the instruction to police to pull back? Why, when the rainbow crowd was tearing down the metal barriers, did police even at that point not intervene? Why did the police press so hard to find out which hotel Posey Parker was staying at? And within hours of them discovering that, she was receiving threatening letters underneath the door of her hotel room. Mm. Why wow. was 
why was Rhonda Stace? Rhonda Stace is a, 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 a transgender individual who is employed by the New Zealand Police and is a previous board member of Auckland Pride. Um, that person was liaising between police and Auckland Pride and the various rainbow groups. The content of one particular email that Rhonda Stace spent, sent, either representing Auckland Pride to the police or a, as a position of a serving police officer sent to Auckland Pride, has been suppressed. Uh, in the OIA response, the entire content of that email, which is pages long apparently, uh, has has been blacked out and... You know, the, the, if, if these issues are not dealt with and seem to be dealt with fairly uh, by the IPCA, I, I very much doubt that they will be meeting the expectations of the victims uh, who were so thoroughly traumatised by what happened to them at Albert Park. Wow. <clears throat> wow. That's, that's fascinating, like, how much detail there is in the story and the power of the videos that you've captured and how it's feeding into, you know, being a witness and, and being interviewed by the independent um, organization that's doing this investigation um, and all these different details of having, you know, how can people find what hotel she's staying at and sending her letters and, it's, it seems like it's an underground network behavior that is not, is in, it's, it's intentional for causing harm than actually standing for your rights. There's nothing about it that's peaceful in any shape or form. No, agreed. And yeah, so I, I think that it, it, it would be fair to say that, that, that operational mistakes were made, but there's, an, there's the ideological aspect to it as well that, uh, you know, it was very, very, obvious that the authorities um, were taking sides and were not were not at all even handed um, and there, there's an, an an international aspect to it too um, uh, you know Posey Parker she has a podcast and <clears throat> I, I, I don't listen to it but I know whenever she's mentioned my name <laughs> because I suddenly start getting you know all of the death threats and the, the hate from the rainbow community um, mm. And this was particularly apparent in September when she was due to return to New Zealand um, to to conduct uh, another attempt at speaking in public uh, to coincide with the court appearance of uh, the man uh, who's accused of pouring tomato juice on her. Um, but uh, the content of the of the police communications from March was provided to me. Um, uh, anonymously, and uh, as soon as I published that, uh, uh, Kelly J. Ken Mitchell, Posey Parker, uh, her family convinced her that New Zealand was not a safe country to to visit, and she cancelled her trip. Wow! Um, and she announced that on 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 her uh, podcast to to um, the cheers of joy from the rainbow community here in New Zealand. And the first that I knew about it was was. Um, was when uh, when those sorts of people started uh, making making me aware of it. Wow, that's New Zealand is not a safe place to be. Yes, it's, um, yes, and that, that's, that's certainly sad, not for her. Sad, sad thing to hear. It is, and <clears throat> um, and and we were in, we were embarrassed internationally once again by that 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 a, firstly that a woman can't come to our country and and speak. But secondly, that uh, in the circumstance where she'd had to flee the country in March, that the authorities and and, and particularly the police yeah. refused when requested. They refused to guarantee her safety. So, you know, I mean, if you're if you're um, Jacinda Ardern uh, getting married in the Hawke's Bay, you can be absolutely guaranteed that you will have uh, red carpet service from the New Zealand police ensuring that uh, you and your guests are not disturbed in the slightest. However, yeah. if you're Kelly Jane, Kelly J. Keane Mitchell, uh, a women's rights activist who's been assaulted and threatened in our country, 
the police don't want to know. Yeah, and I, I and I and I hope that she comes back, and um, she speaks and has that opportunity to speak uh, and stand up for women and women's right and women that want to be part of that, and uh, and we deal with this issue of trans people causing harm instead of just enjoying the space that they have. I certainly concur, and, and I I do. I, I, I feel quite badly about the fact that um, information I released led, led directly to her changing her travel pa- plans. And, and I very much do hope, as you do, that, that she does return and that she has that opportunity and that we can start to rebuild our international reputation. But our first step in that is going to be uh, the impending visit of uh, Graham Linehan to New Zealand. Are you familiar with him? No. Okay, so uh, Graham Linehan is uh, a wonderful uh, comedic writer. He's he's the creator of exceptionally um, well-regarded television shows like Father Ted, The IT Crowd, Black Books. Um, he's, he's he's had a, a very long and successful career in in, um, in British comedy. But he's also been very gender critical, and because of that, he's he was cancelled. Uh, very badly um, by the establishment, particularly the media establishment in Britain. Uh, yeah. But despite that, has continued to be uh, a prominent and outspoken voice on, on women's rights and particularly around the protection of women and women and children um, against the, the ideology of, uh, of, of, of trans. Um, the Free Speech Union of New Zealand as has wonderfully invited him to come and conduct a speaking tour. So he's here uh, next month in March, between March 11th and I think March 21st, uh, to conduct three speaking events, Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. Now, because he is uh, one of, he's a, he's very much a hate figure for the rainbow community, um, you know, like um, uh, J.K. Rowling, Posey yeah. Parker, Graham Linehan, he's up there as a hate figure for for them. Um, So before Posey Parker returns to New Zealand, uh, uh, we have Graham Linehan. And if if the the trans rights activists uh, kick off with more violence uh, at his events, um, then I think she's going to be even less inclined to ever return to our country. Mm. Yeah, I think that stuff just has to stop. Uh, I, I don't get this idea of having these hate figures and, and this rubbish cancel culture of the likes of J.K. Rowling and, and you know, <coughs> it's it just doesn't make any sense and, and I, I wish him a good tour. And uh, are you going to be filming his visit and, he, and, and the tour? Yes, I, I, uh, um, I, I will. I, uh, I intend to film outside. Um, I, I have approached the Free Speech Union uh, and asked for permission to to film inside. I, I haven't heard back from them yet, but of course, you know that is very much their prerogative whether or not uh, I film or not. Uh, it, actually, inside the the venue, um, and I'm sure they'll they'll cover it one way or another anyway. But I sure. would like I would like the latitude to be able to sort of move between outside and inside, so I yeah, can that'll be things. that'll be good capturing of the inside and the outside, and, and I think so. And from the inside. You can show um, what he's talking about, and then connecting the behaviors of what's happening outside from trans community, following a template of creating hate figures and and how they are using that to activate the mainstream media to then you know become sympathizers. It's actually peaceful protest, not hate protest. But you can then kind of mix the two footage, inside outside to kind of see what's going on, which is what was kind of, I would love to have seen that with your shooting of the Troons this weekend. Yes. It's like, you know, if this behavior is happening in the outside, what are they actually discussing inside? Yes. Who yes. is the audience and what are they talking about? It would be really good as a follow up to see if you can find some information about what was discussed inside and maybe interview a couple of people, see if you can find maybe some spy a- agents that kind of <laughs> go in there and pretend to be like, you know. There was one, but uh, oh, unfortunately, really? yes, she she only caught the first half. She was spotted. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. She was spotted? 
Yeah, they, they and they kicked her out. Well, they, well they, there was an intermission halfway through it, and the organizers saw her come and talk to me, and oh, and gave I, away the secret. Uh, yes, but I, I did. I actually hadn't met her before, and I didn't know that she was involved. But, but she'd heard that uh, there was some discussion inside about how that they were the they were going to try and prevent me from filming outside by mobbing me, um, and, right. and she. Um, realized that the potential for me to be assaulted uh, was significant because that was what they were talking about doing to me. So she, during the intermission, came out and warned me that that was their intention. Um, wow. And, and and so that she was not allowed to go back in? Just because they saw her talk to me, yes. Wow. And, and, and uh, so that was that. But I've, I've got an, another story to tell about Graham Linehan, um, and, and that is that, that you know, last year... Um, the, the the Posey Parker footage uh, made me when it went viral, you know, made me, you know, pretty infamous. And it was, I I didn't really know what how to deal with it all. Um, like you know, and as, as I said to you earlier, with media interview requests from some seriously major news organisations, I turned all of that down. Um, but what was really quite wonderful um, was a bunch of people reached out to me to sort of offer support and to give me advice and things like that. Um, like our mutual friend, uh, the wonderful Chris Coveries in in, in Sydney, uh, Graham Linehan was one of those people too. And I've been able to call upon him from time to time uh, over the last twelve months. And you know that what's happening to me is nothing like what what's happened to him. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm just a small fish in in the, in the greater scheme of things. But uh, I've I found his advice to be extremely useful. So uh, and. And, and I've appreciated it, and I, I feel that I owe him a favour, um, and I, you know, I want to ensure that that when he's here, that I I, I cover things fairly, and that I represent his point of view, and that, and that he gets a fair shake. Yeah, I really love the way you you approach the filming you do, and how you do it, and your ability to uh, apply fairness and and you know that ethical thinking in 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 how you film it's 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 a beautiful example of mature citizen journalism it's not just any tom dick and harry with a camera just trying to you know create a an alternate narrative but that narrative is also biased and aggressive at the same time what you see from the left we all love the trans community i love the trans community i have a lot of gay friends um activists and we talk about this issue all the time what is not okay is attacking and creating this sort of underground mob network uh that that you know goes after women that's not cool it's that not. is absolutely not okay um and um it's, it's the same thing you know it's just like imagine if i did that as a male you know i, I would be crucified you would you, you know would. But if I did that, if I decided tomorrow morning, if I woke up and I hated women and I'm going to go become a trans person, call myself Sheila. <laughs> yes, you'll get away with it. Right? I get away with it. You would. Absolutely, you, know, you would. It's, uh, that's, that's not cool. And that, I agree with you. And, that, and that's where I draw the line. I, I think, um, you know, like for most of us, we just want to let people live and let live. It's just, it's when they start hitting people that, Things are going wrong, and yeah, and it's it's the natural result of cancel yeah. culture. And that's the thing about satire is when you see something that's kind of gone wrong, and and it, and and something uh, where you have a really great idea for a satire news story, you know that something's going wrong. And I think one of my favorite one was about Shani Lal, and uh, he had a poster. Uh, j uh, during the Palestine protests, which was closer to the Christmas time, and the poster said that Jesus was from Palestine. Palestine. Right. Right. So my satire story was him sitting on the bench holding a bowl of falafel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. And, and declaring that Jesus was from Palestine, because falafel is a is you know is a dish from that region. <laughs> so it's uh, that's funny. It's that's really, funny. Uh, but that's the thing. It's like satire actually exposes that something is not true. Something is off here. That's the power of satire, 
and then you use that to write these fake news stories that people get to see. It's like you, but the problem is that these young people that follow them, that actually enable their mob behavior, people they believe in that shit. They absolutely do. They're you convinced. Know? They're they're convinced. They're like, oh yeah, Jesus was from Palestine. That's right. And it's like, yes. You're in university. Go to your research center. This university has cost millions of dollars to build. There's a research center. Why don't you just go do better research? You know, not listen to some guy with a poster or holding a ball of falafel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right, and and that's a the, the our education systems no longer teach critical thinking and reasoning and and logic. Instead, what it is, it's it's indoctrination from throughout education where we get these young people and and this is particularly apparent amongst the rainbow community uh and and chanel chanel's uh, uh supporters would certainly be included amongst them where they they are absolutely convinced of the truth of these things and they don't ever bother to stop and actually think about it and and listen and and an aspect of it is uh you know uh, uh gramscian approach to to uh the disem- di- the dissemination of marxist thought uh people know gramsci for um for the quote uh, the long march through the institutions and it's very true where our, our education system has been utterly captured by extreme left wing ideology and it it doesn't seem to matter if it's climate change if it's if it's uh, sexuality and gender issues, if it's uh, minority issues, they're all being used to funnel people's thinking towards a left-wing perspective, and that's happening at primary school, secondary school, and into the tertiary education system. And people like Chanel Lau prey upon it. You know, how is it the case? And, you know, in New Zealand, as in pretty much everywhere else in the world, the 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 cream tends to rise to, to rise to the top and the voices you hear are people who are prominent for a reason because they they're they're smart they've thought about the issues they've performed the public service those sorts of things where, whereas in New Zealand it's not like that where the most prominent voices are some of the most contemptible people and I personally uh, include Chanel Lau in that like how is it that this that a person like that uh, is afforded such a platform? How can he be uh, a leading participant in a mob that assaulted women in Albert Park and then be celebrated by our country four days later as Young New Zealander of the Year? It's just it's just clown world level it ridiculousness. Is, yeah. That's why I wrote a satire piece. <laughs> about Falafel? No, about him winning the award. Oh, did you? Okay, I haven't read that one. Young Terrorist New Zealand oh, of yes, the Year. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's probably more accurate than... Mm. Uh, but again, you know, I'm playing with this narrative of, you know, what is a terrorist? Well, there's that too. I, and I made that comment to uh, Damien Grant, uh, who's a wonderful journalist. Uh, Damien Grant, I commented on one of his threads that you know that one person's terrorist is another person's Nobel Peace Laureate. Yeah, and you know you look down the list of people who've who've uh, who've been awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. There are some people who've done some fairly heinous things. Which is one of my first early um, uh, satire pieces that I wrote that kind of got me into that twenty k, thirty k impressions, and Annie O'Brien retweeted it. Was um, um, uh, Hamas wins the Nobel Peace Prize for the attacks on October the 7th. And uh, <laughs> oh, no. they were also credited for using pipes to create bombs uh, in the physics category. <laughs> <laughs> got, the fi- got the Nobel Prize oh, double in, in peace and physics. Yeah. Oh, that's genius. That's and a genius. close second was Netanyahu. Right for uh, for attacking the civilians, uh, but that didn't really, you know, uh, Hamas had to come first. Yes. But that's you know that that's that's how they're celebrated. They are. They really that's are. That's how they have captured the world, and you know that was their primary focus is to attack. So they create an overreaction, and that's sort of what I commend you with is 
this whole trans attitude and strategy is we're going to go and attack you and assault you and provoke you so you attack us and then we create this whole like you know a narrative uh, around it look narrative how we're, around yes. it and cause an effect and we want it to be a news and we're going to infiltrate thousands and thousands of fire hosing of data it's it's what it's fire hosing of data right create a narrative create a story and then push it through hundreds and thousands of data and then you know that suppresses you and then uplifts them yes that's a very simple media 101 it really is tactic it right? really is uh, and so that's what I commend you with not overreacting when someone's, you know, making disgust, disgusting comments at you. Uh, that's, you know, and that's where that, that was what Hamas was trying to do. And they got that. They got the overreaction yes. from Israel, which then crosses the boundary around what you can and can't do with human rights, right? And then that, that is then seen in the world where there is Palestinian supporters, they say, well, yep, Hamas did do something that's not okay, but they've done something that's bigger. So we're going to rally against that. You know? And that's that, astonishing, and that, isn't it? And, it's and, media and, warfare. Yeah, it is. And they succeeded in that. And the best thing, Elon Musk said this, the best thing that Israel could have done is to not overreact. Yes. That's the best thing they could have done. Um, and that's the, the act of passive resistance. That's what Parihaka taught Mahatma Gandhi to do to fight the Brits and leave and leave the country that he wanted to, uh, you know, uh, make independent from the British's ruling. He achieved that. People in New Zealand learn about Parihaka in India, right? And then you have Te Pāti Māori and the co-leader of Te Pāti Māori, who is from Taranaki, behaves in totally radical left and organizing these protests and wanting to do this violent acts against the government. And she should be reminded, maybe you should go spend a weekend at Parihaka. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. And that's when she did hold the, she did the protest uh, during the, I think, uh, the first week of parliament when... Um, you know how she organized this whole protest? Yes. You remember that? And that was one of my satire piece that I wrote about how she organized this attack, like the capital rights in the States. And uh, the story goes with this angle of she organized thousands of people to get into the, uh, the beehive, the parliament, attack the whole thing. And uh, there are a few people dead and all everybody is, you know, running away in the bunker and hiding. And all these protesters are taken over the, the seats in the parliament. And Debbie is arrested. Right? So what I was trying to do there is media takes a very soft approach to the oppressed view and how they uh, uh, speak of violent things that they want to do, just in the trans people versus to the oppressors using violence behavior, right? So that's sort of very interesting in terms of how when you kind of compare those two things. It is. It is very. So for me, it was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to write. I'm just going to write an article about how a media would report these guys doing something that is violent, you know? Uh, Te Pāti Māori doing something that's violent, you know. Um, I think that, yeah, that was like 20,000, 30,000 impressions. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, which is super interesting. Um, but thanks for coming to the show, man. Well, I'm thanks for inviting me. It's, really uh, it's a wonderful it. opportunity to The power to of up. video, the power of um, independent media, um, you know, it's power of breaking through the narratives that media capture and, um, you know, just how it's so impactful to, uh, you know, leading us to this point where we have such a better view of what happened during the March last year protests was not peaceful, was aggressive and made us aware as New Zealanders the behavior that's going on in the trans community 
and that's not okay behavior and that has to be addressed and the independent review with the New Zealand police has to bring some changes in operations and protecting women, uh, removing gender confusion and with children, removing that conversations in the classrooms. Um, yeah, thank you for for doing the work you do. Oh, th- well, thank you for the work you do. I think I think it's really wonderful that people like us can you know follow an interest and uh, you know to to share perspectives and to have conversations and and exchange ideas and share that with a broader audience. I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm sure I'll have you back. I'm looking forward to it already. That's awesome. Bye, everybody. Thanks.